I'll invite you, if you have your Bibles with you, or if you use your Bible app on your phone, let's find Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, we're going to be talking about uh, Give Christ. We've been in, I guess you could call it a series of kind of what of our, our uh, motto of our church, if you want to call it that, that we, we know, love, live, and give Christ. And here we are at the beginning of the year, I think it's a good time for us just to be reminded of who we are supposed to be, who we say that we are. As a church, we are those who know, love, live, and give Christ. And this week, we're focusing on give Christ. You know, as members of the human race, even as followers of Christ, we may be subject to experiencing desperate situations from time to time. Anybody know what that's like? Oh, yeah. You know, crowds of people, they just followed Jesus everywhere he went. They were absolutely amazed at his teachings. They loved to watch the miracles that he did. They just wanted more and more, so they followed him everywhere he went. There was one time he actually went out into the middle of nowhere, and the crowd just followed him. <laughs> the crowd just followed him. We know that there was a crowd of about 5,000 that followed him. And it was getting late in the day, and everyone was hungry and tired. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, hey, send everybody home so they can go get home, get something to eat, have a place to rest before it gets dark. And Jesus told them, no, no, you feed them. Can you imagine the sense of desperation <laughs> that the disciples <laughs> experienced? You know, we don't truly appreciate that desperation, do we? Because we know at the end of the story. We already know how it turns out. They didn't have any food for themselves, much less for 5,000 people, and they certainly didn't have enough money to buy food for the crowd. But when all was said and done, Jesus fed the crowd with one little boy's lunch. He fed 5,000 people. And the disciples went from desperate to dumbfounded when each and every one of them collected a basket full of scraps. Jesus fed 5,000 and there were 12 baskets of scraps left over. There was another occasion in which a man brought his son to the disciples, asking them to cast out a demon that had been torturing his, his son most of his life, ever since he was young. Made him mute, Caused, caused seizures and would even try to kill the boy, sometimes throwing him into a seizure, rolling around on the floor, throwing him into the fire even. As the disciples tried to cast out the demon, they weren't having any, any luck, so some teachers of the religious law began to engage with them. They were probably critiquing their methods. You know, oh, that's not the right way to do it. You need to do it this way. Boy, I'll tell you what, you get church people trying to figure something out, and they can get in an argument in a hot bar, can't they? <clears throat> and so the disciples, <clears throat> not only were they failing to cast out this demon, but they were arguing with these teachers of the religious law. And then a crowd began to gather, because they wanted to watch the showdown. Actually, there were two to pick from, you know? There was a showdown with the demon, and then there was a showdown between the religious leaders and the, and the disciples. Boy, that, they, the crowd just really started honing in on that. The tension and the pressures just continued to build, and try as they might, the disciples just couldn't cast that demon out. You know, we don't really appreciate the desperation of that situation, do we? Because we know how the story turns out. But can you imagine the desperation that that poor helpless father felt? All these years trying to help his son, trying to find someone who could help his son, doing anything that he possibly could to help his son to no avail. He was frantic at the end of his rope. Didn't know what to do. All he wanted to do was for his son to be a happy, healthy little boy. 
Imagine the desperation of the little boy. All this stuff was happening to him, and certainly he couldn't understand it. He couldn't make sense of it all. He didn't know what was going on. He experienced all the physical pain associated with the abuse from the demon. And who knows what kind of mental anguish and mental toll it took on that little boy. And no matter what the disciples did, no matter what they tried, they just couldn't figure out how to help the little boy. Then Jesus shows up. And Jesus comes up and says, what's going on? And he cast the demon out of the little boy. When the demon left, he left the little boy in such a violent fashion that the little boy appeared to be dead. Matter of fact, that's what the crowd kind of started murmuring. Oh my goodness, he's dead. It's over. He's dead. Do you feel that desperation? <clears throat> but the father, the disciples, and the whole crowd went from desperate to dumbfounded as Jesus took the little boy by the hand and helped him stand up and gave him back to his father. These situations were learning opportunities for the disciples. Unfortunately, you and I can benefit from those learning opportunities as we read in our text. And as we read in our text today, we'll see that the disciples took these lessons, these learning opportunities to heart because it affected their ministry after Jesus was gone. Join me in Acts chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> Luke tells us, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And the man began leaping up. He stood up and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. It makes me think of that children's song, walking and leaping and praising God. How many of you know that? Come on, you don't know that one? I'll have to teach it to you. <laughs> Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's pray together. Lord, there are many times that we find ourselves in desperate situations. Many times when we're confronted with a, a situation, we just don't know what to do. And as try and try as we might, we just can't resolve the problem. Lord, we thank you that you always show up. And you show up not just for us, but you show up through us sometimes, Lord. And that's what we want to get to today, Lord, that we can get to a point where you can show up through us so that we can give Christ to others and there will be a difference that's made in their lives that brings them closer to you, that brings them not only into relationship and fellowship with you, but into eternal life with you. So, Lord, teach us from these words. Help us to learn the lessons that the disciples learned so many years ago. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, 
I'll just start off by saying, more than likely, we won't encounter such dramatic situations. More than likely, we won't encounter demon possession. And if we do, we really probably wouldn't recognize it. Because nowadays, we, we call a lot of that, we call a lot of different things, don't we? I'm, you know, yeah, we, there's a lot of times we change the terminology from what it really is to make it more palatable. There are people who are suffering from mental illness who are also truly dealing with demons in their lives. And we use that as a figurative term, but we don't acknowledge that there could be a, a literal spiritual activity taking place. But most of us will not experience such a dramatic encounter. Most of us will not experience someone being healed who's lame or uh, someone who's blind being able to see in a miraculous situation. Most of us just won't experience those dramatic type healings. But we will definitely have those same learning opportunities that the disciples had. That to truly give Christ to others, we must get to the end of ourselves. We must get to that point of desperation where the only thing that's going to save the day is Jesus showing up. We must achieve and maintain that position and, that, and a disposition of desperation so that we have no other option but to put all of our hope and faith and trust in Jesus. Because it's only then that we'll see him do his most amazing work. See, Peter and John were there when Jesus fed 5,000 people. And they were there when Jesus cast the demon out of that little boy. And there were many other times that Jesus said or did something amazing, something miraculous. Peter and John were there. Many of those times, they experienced the desperation. Many of those times, they wondered, how is this going to be resolved? How is this person going to be helped? And every time they were able to witness Jesus do something amazing. After Jesus ascended into heaven, they had learned to remain in this state of desperation, of total dependence on Jesus. I mean, their whole lives had been changed, and now they were living with a new agenda, and that's to give Christ to a world that so desperately needs him. The world still needs him today. As we look deeper into these verses we just read, I believe we'll identify three items that we can incorporate into our agendas that will allow us to give Christ more freely to those around us. The first agenda item there, if you want to call it that, is giving Christ affects our agenda. First thing on our agenda is allow Christ to set our agenda, <laughs> right? Some of you uh, may be familiar with the story I've told on my wife, how uh, most days she has to start her day by making out her list of things to do. And at the very top of the list, it says, make list of things to do. <laughs> That's not true. But <laughs> might be a slight exaggeration. <laughs> but she'll tell you she has to have her list, too. But this is kind of like what we all need to do. Set that at the top of our list. Let God set our agenda. Peter and John demonstrate how they allowed God, how they allowed Christ to set their agenda. We read in these verses that they were on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer to pray. Now, there's a few things we can pick up right there that tell us about Peter and John's uh, agenda priorities. Now, the temple represented the presence of God to the Jews. When the Jews thought about the temple, they thought about the presence 
of God. That was the house of God. That is where God dwelled in their minds. And so in order to meet with God, they had to go to the temple. Peter and John went to the temple many times with Jesus. And they continued going to the temple even after Jesus had ascended into heaven. Speaking of that, Peter and John spent three years with Jesus. I mean, they were literally in the presence, in the very presence of God himself. And they went to pray. They went to the temple to pray. You know, you may remember on the night that Jesus was arrested, they were with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times Jesus asked them to pray. And all three times he found them sleeping. I just have to wonder, how many times did they go to the temple with Jesus and fall asleep? <laughs> we all can relate on something like that, okay? Right? <laughs> but Peter, there was something different about Peter and John. They were desperate to spend time with Jesus in order to maintain that sense of desperation in their lives and dependence on God. They knew that they had to spend time with him. They knew that they had to get in every minute they could in his presence. And they were committed to doing just that in the place that represented God's presence. And the practice of prayer allowed them to focus on Jesus. They, they were able to put away all the other distractions. How many times do you go to pray and the phone rings, the dog barks, the doorbell rings? Over and over again, there are distractions that pop up to keep us from praying. Peter and John just made it a commitment to get to a place where they could remove all the distractions and focus on God. They made prayer a priority, and it was a habit that helped keep them connected with Jesus. It's a habit that we all can incorporate into our lives as well. It's just one example of how giving Christ begins with us giving Christ control of our agenda. <clears throat> the lame man, <clears throat> the lame man had an agenda too. See, going to the temple was a regular part of his daily agenda. You might even say that he went regardless of his personal agenda because he had people who picked him up and took him there, and he couldn't do anything about it. Whether he wanted to or not, he was placed there daily to beg for alms. I mean, begging for alms really was his best way of supporting himself, the best opportunity he had to support himself. Begging for alms at the temple was very strategic uh, because who are you going to find at the temple? Most likely you're going to find the most charitable people at the temple. It was a significant value in Judaism to give alms to the poor. And so as, as Jews were going to the temple to practice their religious rituals, they most likely were going to be prepared to give alms to the poor. So all three men, Peter and John and the lame man, all three men were there to get something. You know, the lame man represents a world without Jesus, just desperately trying to survive the day. How many people do you know like that? People who are literally or figuratively, physically or spiritually, lame, lost, and hopeless without Christ just trying to make it through another day. You know anybody like that? If you don't, you need to get out more. <laughs> They're everywhere. <clears throat> and if we're going to give Christ, we must be committed to prioritizing our time with him, developing habits that will help keep us connected and grow closer and closer to him. Because we cannot give what we do not have. We cannot give what we do not have. And we don't have to go looking far to be able to find opportunities to give Christ. 
Second item is that giving Christ control of our agenda means that there are times we'll have to adjust our agenda. Put yourself in the lame man's position for a moment, unable to do anything for himself, dependent on others for all of his needs, sitting outside the temple every day, begging for alms, and probably experiencing more rejection than sympathy. I kind of even wonder sometimes, how often when Jesus and Peter and John and the disciples were going up to his temple, how often did they walk by this man? How often had he seen them walk into the temple? I mean, who could blame him if he just decided to give up? I'm sure there were many days that he did. I'm sure it was easy just to keep your eyes down, maybe even roll over and go to sleep and wait for your friends to come back and take you home at the end of the day. But on this day, somehow, this lame man had mustered just enough hope to ask again. Just to, just to try again. Verse 3 tells us that when he lifted up his eyes, Peter and John just happened to be walking by, and he asked them for money. You know, we can get so locked in to our daily agenda, to our routine, that we just don't allow room for anything else. You've been there. You know what that's like. <clears throat> and you certainly know others who, who are the same way. I can envision Peter and John, these two men, they're on a mission. The call to prayer had been issued. They were on their way to have their special time connecting with Jesus. How easy it would have been just to walk right on by, just to ignore the lame man. You can't help but wonder how many times they had done just that. How many times had they seen this lame man just laying there? How many times did they enter the temple being very careful not to make eye contact as they passed? You know, this really wouldn't be much of a story if Peter and John had not been willing to adjust their agenda. We wouldn't even be reading these verses if they had been so focused on going into the temple to pray and so inflexible with their agenda and their schedule that they just kept right on walking by the lame man calling, who was calling out to them. Verse 4 said that Peter not only looked at him, but he asked the lame man to look back. And verse 5 says the lame man looked at them expecting to receive something. Boy, everybody's agendas are being interrupted. That, that day, weren't they? You know, when I worked years ago, I worked in a grocery store down in South Carolina where I grew up. And the owner and manager of the store used to always tell us that in order to provide good customer service, we need to be willing to embrace the interruption. No matter where we were or what we were doing, <clears throat> if there was a customer who needed help, if there was a customer who needed something, we were to stop what we were doing and do whatever we need to do to help that customer. We had to embrace the interruption. And that's exactly what Peter and John did in that moment. Their mindset was responding to the call to prayer to go and meet with Jesus. But when the lame man called out, they embraced the interruption. But wait a minute. There's a problem here. Peter and John didn't have any money. <laughs> the lame man was asking for money, asking for alms, and they didn't have any. So they're off the hook. They go about <laughs> their business. I know that's how I most often appreciate, uh, um, approach the situation. It's so easy just to say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have any money. A lot of times I say my wife doesn't let me carry cash. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. You know, we're off the hook. We can go about our agenda. We can get back on track. <clears throat> it 
Peter and John didn't have what the lame man was asking for, but they were willing to give what they had. Are we willing to do the same thing? The lame man's life was radically changed in an instant when Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I mean, he received something far better than money. He experienced the healing power of Jesus. And when it comes to giving away money, what's money? We can always go earn more. We can give it away really easily. Most likely we're going to sit on it, be stingy with it, not give it away. But if we're willing to adjust our agenda and give Christ, we might get to see God do some absolutely amazing, maybe even miraculous things. And that brings us to our third item. Giving Christ aims towards God's agenda. Look at verses 9 and 10 again. It says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. You know, this was a common occurrence as Jesus as Jesus performed miracles, all the people all around who witnessed it were always amazed, pondering, how could this happen? What just happened? And as John and Peter continued the work of Jesus, you have the same response from the people who witnessed it. Back in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, John records an event in which Jesus healed a man who had been blind from birth. The disciples were asking if the man was blind because of, his, of the sin of his parents. And Jesus explained, hey, this isn't about sin. This isn't about who sinned. You know, disease, blindness, a lot of those things, yes, they are a reality because we are a part of a sinful race. But this, this isn't about who sinned. Jesus explained it's about an opportunity to give his love. It's an give, opportunity to give glory to God, aiming people towards God's agenda. In verses 4 and 5 of John chapter 9, Jesus says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because night is coming when no one can work. <clears throat> as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Some of us may read those verses and think, okay, as long as Jesus is in the world, it's time to work. Jesus ascended into heaven over 2,000 years ago. Now what? Who's the light of the world now? Who is responsible to go to work now, to do the work of him who sent Jesus. Matthew answers that question in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, where again, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but up on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, when we give Christ, we point people to God. When we give Christ, we aim their attention toward God's agenda. Many of you are familiar with Corey Ten Boom. She and her family certainly experienced desperation, but it never stopped them from giving Christ. 
motivated by their faith, they helped Jews hide and escape from the Nazis and the Holocaust. Eventually, though, their home was raided by the Nazis and their family were sent off to prison camp. Tori was even sent to a death camp, but she miraculously somehow survived. And Tori apparently learned the same lessons as the disciples because she went through those very desperate situations. She continued to put her faith and trust in Jesus as she did. You can read more about her experiences as she's written several books all of them illustrate the goodness and faithfulness of God. But as I said earlier, you and I most likely will never experience such a, a dramatic situation as we've read or heard about today. But we can certainly give Christ in the everyday opportunities that come our way. I might not have a lot of money to give away, but I can give my lunch. I actually had an opportunity to do that the other week with one of the students at school. I wasn't going to get to eat lunch anyway. <laughs> I might not have a lot of money, but I can give my lunch. I can give a coat to someone who's cold. I can lend an ear to someone who's lonely. And as I do, I give Christ. Everyday opportunities to give Christ, they're not usually very dramatic. In fact, they're so simple that they're barely any sacrifice at all. But giving Christ the face, the priorities of our agenda. Giving Christ requires us to be flexible and willing to make adjustments in our agendas. And giving Christ ultimately aims the attention of others towards God's agenda. I'll close with a quote by Corey Ten Boom. And I think it's so relevant as we think about being in a constant state of de desperation and still being able to give Christ out of that. She says, you may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. What better truth is there to cling to? What better truth is there to share with others? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for just your power as demonstrated through Peter and John. The same power that you used to heal people when you walked on the earth. The same power that raised you from the dead. And that's the same power that you offer to us. And it is best demonstrated when we are in a position of desperation and complete dependence on you. We'll never truly experience the fullness of your power as long as we're depending on our own abilities and our own strength. Lord, teach us to be weak. Teach us to be desperate. Teach us to get to the end of ourselves so that there is nothing left but Jesus. And then, Lord, we ask you to do some incredible, amazing things in the world around us so that those who are lost, hopeless, spiritually lame might have an opportunity to see you at work come to know you, and ultimately have eternal life with you. Lord, we pray these things for your glory. And in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here today. Pray that you are blessed. Have a great week. Um, keep an eye on the weather. It looks like there is a big one coming. <laughs> so uh, stay tuned to... Uh, Email, text, Facebook, we will post what we're doing next Sunday if we have to make a decision. God bless. Thank have you. a great week.